theologian and all of that, and, uh, and he and I, he gonna have this conversation with this practitioner, myself, and this third grade dropout, and uh, I'm gonna be speaking Ebonic, and he's gonna be speaking English <laughs> and we, uh, this morning, so we're gonna have a great Bible study here together this morning, and we're gonna deal with really practical and theologically reconciliation uh, 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 this morning, so we're gonna have a good time here together. But also, um, uh, they give me this hour every year, and I thank God for it, uh, this time that we can really have conversation around the Word of God. But we also want to have conversation around issues that are very relevant. That's what I want to make this time, that we could bring people here that was doing things that was very relevant to our situation, that we understand the time in which we live, and so we know what we want to find out what God is saying and what we ought to be doing as God's people. And so this morning I have a, a young, this young emerging church is something wonderful that we are wanting to turn CCDA, uh, we want uh, much of the leadership over to this whole new generation of young people. And Lisa Hopper here represent one of those young people. She brought together this summer at Princeton University, she brought together a broad base, one of the greatest broad base of the emerging church gatherers, where we could really have conversation about the time in which we are living and how we can make Jesus Christ real in our generation. And that she have just uh, uh, wrote a book, and, and it's called, uh, uh, it's called, uh, what is it called? I'm gonna get it here. here. <laughs> Evangelica, evangelicalism is not, uh, Republican or Democrat. And I got her here and I want her to tell me, talk to us a little bit, about three minutes, about why she wrote this book and what is basically in it and why should all of us rush out and buy it. Okay, Lisa. That's right. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Perkins. Um, well, I was approached to write this book and the original title of the book was Evangelical Does Not Equal Republican. And I said, well, I'm not going to write that book. I, I want to write a book that it says evangelical does not equal Republican dot, 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 or Democrat. Because evangelical does not equal Republican is not prophetic. Everybody knows that, of course, you know, whatever. And it's got feeling like old hat. But to say that it's not either really begs the question, well, then what is it? Well, then what is it? When I was, uh, when I became a Christian um, in 1983, August 21st, 1983, at 8.30 p.m., uh, at a Sunday evening camp church meeting in Cape May, New Jersey. Um, it was a rural, white, fundamentalist church. And I was tapped on the shoulder by the woman sitting next to me, the girl, my, my best friend sitting next to me, who was already a Christian. And she, she was weeping at the end of this hellfire and brimstone um, sermon. Which, and I was, I was actually thinking, maybe I should go up too. Maybe I should go up too, because I hadn't ever gone up. But I had done sing-a-thons for Jesus and walk-a-thons for Jesus and sung the, the flute at church for Jesus. So I thought, well, surely I'm a Christian. And so she tapped me on the shoulder and she said, you know, can you go up with me? And I said, yes. And I went up just to be with her, but everybody surrounded me too, you know, and they put their hands on me. And next thing you know, I'm weeping and I got into the kingdom by proxy that day. <laughs> I did. And so, and I remember, I remember I was on a diet like I was for most of my childhood. <laughs> And I had gotten on the scale that morning, and I got on the scale that night. I was wondering, you know, was this real? Did something really happen? And I was 10 pounds lighter. I was. There was a real spiritual burden that was lifted off my shoulder that day. And it was still the same the next day. So I know that conversion was real, but very soon after that, I had another conversion. Because it was 1983, and it was the year that Reagan was running for president again for his second term. And I was told very soon, you have to be Republican. Because to be Christian means to be Republican. And so, I mean, that, now, let me tell you, okay, so I, one day I came home with a tract and I showed it to my sister and I made her just scream to my mom and dad crying because on this tract it said, if Mondale wins this, this election, all the little children will be rounded up and taken to concentration camps because he's the Antichrist. That was what they were saying back in 1983 about Mondale. And so I, I showed it to my sister, and she went running to my mom, screaming, you have, to, you have to vote for Mondale, you have to vote for Mondale, or else we're going to go to concentration camps. She came out to me, and she said, where did you get that? And I said, it, it, at church, so it must be true. And she said, 
well, I'm taking you out of that church. And I famously said, well, you can take the girl out of the church, but you can't take the church out of the girl. And she never did take me out of that church. But you know what happened is our relationship from that day forward broke because my mother was a member of SNCC back in the 60s. And the time that Stokely Carmichael was the chairman, and she was a, a, one of the charter members, if they had charter members, one of the founding members of the Philadelphia office in, 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 uh, in Phil well, Philadelphia. And so she could not understand how her daughter could get swept up into something that would make her feel like not only in order to be a Christian should she, you know, have to be born again, which she had no idea what that was, but, you know, that, I, I believe that, I do believe that's still true, but, but also I had to convert and become another party. So this book is actually the story of how that happened in evangelical history. How did it happen that our faith became married to a political party? How did it happen that our faith became married to only a few issues? And how is it that God is turning that tide back, turning us back to our roots? And actually, one of the pivotal chapters in this book is a chapter about the prophets in the mid-20th century who shouted out on courthouse steps in, in urban neighborhoods and began to lay the foundations for the shift that we're seeing now, which is not and I repeat, is not a political shift. The shift that we are seeing now is fundamentally a broadening in what we see, how we perceive the good news of Scripture. And that good news is coming to us now from the margins. It has come, actually, from the margins of evangelicalism. John Perkins being among the chief prophets of the 20th, 20th century, one of the ones who laid the foundation for this current shift that we see. Because now, this current generation is looking at our broken world. They're looking at tsunamis. They're looking at hurricanes. They're looking at Haiti. They're looking at a crashing Wall Street. They're looking at the impoverished poor who are dealing with environmental injustices, toxins on their land, and increasing numbers of people dealing with cancer and diabetes in urban neighborhoods. And they're saying, how is my gospel relevant now? And because they're finding a gospel of shalom, and that really is it, it's the gospel of shalom, the good news of shalom and the kingdom of God together, I believe that it's causing a shift in the things that we are interested in. We're no longer interested in either or. We are now a both and generation. So I hope that you will go out and buy the book because I think that it'll help you to communicate. My hope is that it would help you to communicate this to your friends and family back home. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you. You all go out and buy Lisa's book. Um, uh, I was, in, um, I was in Durham, North Carolina a few months ago. Okay, you can clap. <laughs> and, um, and I met uh, this judge, Elaine Bushfan. And I was speaking, and we was just had a talk back after I spoke. And we were talking about the situation we have in terms of young black men in prison in America that you were talking about 69, almost 7%, and depends on what state you're in, uh, of the prison population being made up out of uh, young blacks. And uh, we was discussing this, and I gave a talk there, and that this judge got up and spoke to us about the situation. And I was so moved by it. And not only she speak, spoke to us about it, but she was speaking to us over her tears as a chief judge. And all of these young black people, she had to just keep on sending to prison. And I said, I'd like for you to come and share some of this with us here at CCDA. Uh, Christian, passionate, mother, judge. And, uh, and she was talking about the idea of her. She had to wrestle with doing, being a judge, and wrestle with that every day. Seeing all those black young men just sent off to, to, to prison. Uh, judge, uh, would you come and talk to us? 
Sure, take uh, eight minutes <laughs> to talk to us about the situation. Good morning, everybody. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. I bring you greetings from Durham, North Carolina, where I am the Chief District Court Judge of the 14th Judicial District. Durham County is about 225,000 people. I also bring you greetings from First Calvary Baptist Church. My minister is Pastor Fred Davis. And I thank you for allowing me to come to talk to you this morning. I thank Uncle John and Aunt Vera, who I have not met, but I feel like I already know. And I also thank all of my Durham friends who have helped me to be here today. I just ask that you keep one thought in mind as I try to present to you very briefly. And that is, are we dressing people up and they have no place to go? Journey me, with me, if you will, to my courtroom. I've been a presiding judge now for 14 years. In my courtroom in criminal district court, we run two criminal courtrooms a day at the district court level. We have a total of seven judges. We also run a jail in our court, in our court, in our jail, a courtroom in our jail. And we also have superior court judges who handle the higher level felonies. My criminal courtroom is probably about the size of this middle section, maybe a little larger. And when I go in there on most days, Monday through Friday, it is jam-packed all around, from wall to wall. And it is black, and it is becoming increasingly brown. We're going to have to deal with the issues of race in this country. And we're going to have to deal with our criminal justice system. I am the head of a very profitable and successful corporation. And with any corporation, you have a product. And our product is human beings, primarily African-American men, followed by African-American women. The scary part for me is that this is going on all across these United States every single day. And nobody wants to deal with it. And we have to deal with it. It is painful to talk about slavery. It is painful to talk about the civil rights movement. It is painful to talk about laws that keep people in bondage. But it is necessary. And we are to heal. And if we are a truly Christian nation, and if we are the people who have been called by God to do what we do, then we must deal with these issues. If you are in your communities, in the places that you shop, in the places that you eat, in the places where you have your recreation, and everybody looks like you, or, or in your socioeconomic class, if you don't see anybody that you're reaching out to on your job, I try to think of it like this. There are three places that I frequent most. My neighborhood, my home, my church, and my job. Where would Jesus be if he walked with me? Most of the time, he would be on my job. He would not be in my neighborhood because I live in a cul-de-sac. I live in the middle class community, and everybody basically looks like me or are in my socioeconomic group. When I go to church, it's the same thing. The people that I see at work don't interact with me in my community. I don't shop where they shop. I don't live where they live. But yet, I am supposed to have an impact on their lives. I was in court the other day, and I had a young man at 16 years of age, and he was charged with sexual battery. He was found guilty of, not by trial, he pled guilty to kissing a young lady and rubbing her breast. 
As a part of the plea, he was placed on probation and had to undergo treatment, and he also had to register as a sex offender. Keep it right there. And forward 10 years. If he's not picked up even a traffic ticket, if he's not littered, when you go to your computer and you pluck in sexual offender, he will come up somewhere in somebody's neighborhood. But we don't want him there. So which is the greater punishment, the probation and the treatment or the label? When you see African-American men who have been caught, and most of the people that I see are dealing with survival issues. There are people who come to jail every day for stealing steaks out of a local grocery store and they lose their freedom because they want to eat. But yet somehow or another we can manage to find an excuse for 800 billion being lost and nobody goes to jail. In my neighborhood that's armed robbery. When you place labels on people of convicted felons and you ask those who are elected to represent you in the various governmental entities that you have and you say to them, we need to know if we have felons working on our jobs. We need to know if people um, are violent. That has some truism to it. But it also causes people to be locked out. Every time young men go and they try to find a job and on the job it says, are you a convicted felon? And you can become a convicted felon in certain states at the age of 16. Which is the greater punishment after they paid their price to society through my system? And then they can't find a job. And we somehow miraculously try to figure out why we have gangs. This is not rocket science. I question if we really want to help people or are we really dressing people up, fixing them, and they have no place to go. They have no place to go. They're locked into this cycle and we keep them there. We are all guilty of it. If our communities don't reach out and we like to feel good about the stuff that we do. That's good. We should. But if our communities are not their communities and their communities are not our communities, what have we done? We're going to have to deal with it. Change is coming. It is necessary. So the next time that you go to your home or you go to your job, you think about all those people who are locked out of society, who are marginalized, and you ask yourself, what in my life is going to impact that? How do I change that? Why can't, how is it that my neighborhood can be different? Am I really bringing people into my church? Am I really seeing an awesome God who moves in all people? Do I really value people who are not of my color, who are not of my socioeconomic status? And I would say to you, based on what I see every day, that we've got a lot of work to do. We've got a lot of work to do, Christians. This is my first time talking to an all-Christian organization, and I thank God for it. But I must bring you the truth. We have turned off a lot of people. We have lost our stand, our place in society. And I think it's because we have forgotten that God would not be in four walls. He would be out on the streets with the prostitutes, the drug addicts, the burglars, the rapists, the robbers. He would be on my job.
Thank you so much for this time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, next, at our next convention in Cincinnati, um, I want my sister to come back and uh, conduct a workshop. Help us to think through what we can do to prevent this tragedy. And it is a tragedy. It's a tragedy. It's a, it's a result of, as somebody said, a broken system broken system. Jesus never intended there was to be prison. Prison represents our clear failure, society's failure. And so we all have failed because there is many things that the church could be doing. Uh, having hope houses, having places for the young men when they come out of prison and, and, and taking care of them and finding jobs for them, putting them back in society. We've got to get serious about this serious about this. What's fear, what I'm so fearful is that some of the young educated criminals are going to be able to communicate to the young people out in society our own failure, how we have failed them. This going to, and that could be a dangerous situation for America. If we would just explain, if, if, if those young people could understand how we, the church, and all of us as a society neglected them and created this kind of situation, did not use our resources within the school and within the home and the places we ought to have been using them to make life better. And so we got to hear more of this. I believe that the people with the problem, she's the one that got the problem. That's why she's so passionate. She's the one that got the problem to see her own sons coming before her every day being sent to prison. And we got, she, but she also got to help us. That's what CCD is about. CC is about the people with the problem taking responsibility for it and then begin to share this problem with all of us together. So we thank, let's give her another hand. Come on up. Uh, uh, Paul Messenger and I have developed a, a partnership. We call it the Drum Majors for Justice drum majors for justice. And we are putting on uh, some speaking, doing some speaking around the country, he and I. And I was thinking if, we, if I had a theologian who could speak clear English and understood this biblical stuff real good, and then a guy like me, a practitioner who speaks Ebonic, because every once in a while when I'm speaking, I notice that everybody, when I say something Ebonic, they have to turn to another black person to ask, what did I say? And I said, I'm gonna solve that problem. Is it, is, I'm gonna solve that problem. And I'm gonna get somebody who can interpret this stuff, this Ebony uh, for you. And so Paul and I uh, are gonna have a discussion this morning. And if you want us to come uh, and put on one of these conferences, we're gonna put on about two of them a year around the country. Well, we're gonna put on one in, in uh, Portland. When is that? November 20th and 21st. November 20th and 21st. It's a big deal. It's a part of our Louis Palau big uh, uh, rally he's having out there. And we're going to be speaking together uh, out there. And this morning, what we want to talk about here is, uh, is reconciliation. Paul, would you read the passage we're going to deal with? This sort is of an interview like. This is from Luke chapter 10, 25 to 37, Luke chapter 10, verse 25 to 37. And it's the parable of the Samaritan of extraordinary mercy. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho 
when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. The first question that we're going to interact on is, who is my neighbor? That's a big question here, is the religious expert in the law seeks to ask Jesus in order to seek to justify himself. And so he asks, who is my neighbor? And with that, I'd like to add, Dr. Perkins, as you answer that question, Henry Nouwen's definition of community. Nouwen said, the place where the person you least want to live with always lives, that's the definition of true community. So in light of that, what do you think Jesus is really getting at? Who is my neighbor? I, I think you have to have an understanding of the, the, the Samaritan situation and the Jewish situation of that day. Uh, the Samaritan had been that group of mixed race group that they had brought in when their first captivity, uh, before the Babylonian captivity, uh, the Assyrian Rita captivity, and that uh, they had repeopled that place. And because of the division within the nation, the Samaritans then, who was sort of somewhat half Jew, got mixed race, it was a mixed race group, and that they did not go down to the temple in Jerusalem to worship, but they had established their own temple up there. And that was so resented by the Jewish people. And so the Samaritan people, when Jesus was here on earth, was the most despised group of people on earth of that time. They said that if a Jew was going down the street on a sunshiny day and, uh, and was passing a Samaritan, he would walk out in a way that his own shadow would not cross the Samaritan shadow because they looked at him as being such a despised group of people. And, and so the, this Samaritan represents the real dehumanized. But what I get from that story so quickly is that this Samaritan had really been the person who have had his sin forgiven. And I think that once you have had, and one of the things that I'm, concerned about I'm preaching to you now one of the things I'm so concerned about I don't think that we can be like that good Samaritan unless and we have a good understanding of sin and the depths of sin and not understanding God's forgiving grace we're going to see that as we move along I think that's the big issue uh, this Samaritan had overcome his own psychological damage and that he had failed so confident and so forgiven that he could reach out to any person uh, around him. And I think that's what's holding us back. As I have traveled around the world, particularly with the most, the most dehumanized group that I met in the world have been the Aborigines in Australia. I cannot talk to them about the future because they are so caught up with the past. And the only person who can forgive you for the past and who can forgive the sin of others that have been afflicted upon you is Jesus himself. He is the only one that can forgive sin. And I think this Samaritan person here represents deeply, and I, I really believe some of our lack of progress in my community has to do so much with the blame and that we haven't been able to get a hand on how can we... Uh, Ask for forgiven, how can we give forgiven? How can we feel forgiven? And so most of, I believe much of our poverty is tied to the fact that we can't look creatively in the future because we are so burdened down with the past. 
And so this Samaritan guy who was very successful, you're going to see that, has got rid of the past. And now he can see people uh, because he has been forgiven and he has forgiven others. Along those same lines, I think he was able to get beyond the stereotypes of who he was. And uh, we'll get into why Jesus was, would use a Samaritan to get at the story of what a truly good neighbor is about. But uh, nowhere in the text does it say that this is the parable of the Good Samaritan. That's only probably in your heading in your English Bible. Nowhere in the text does it say that this guy's a Good Samaritan. And it was actually, I found this in an essay written that in the original African Heritage Study Bible, it's reframed that the lawyer's question for the heading, it's the lawyer's question, the Samaritan of extraordinary mercy. The lawyer's question, the Samaritan of extraordinary mercy, because good Samaritan suggests, well, that he's, he's not the run-of-the-mill Samaritan. He's actually a good Samaritan. And it's actually a people who's been oppressed that can actually be sensitive to that. You know, that it was actually in the African Heritage Study Bible, the original, that it was really about a Samaritan of extraordinary mercy. And I think we have to get beyond our labeling of people. And Jesus is actually turning the tables on this guy. When the guy goes to test him, he says, let me tell you what a truly good neighbor is like, and it's going to look a lot different from the stereotype that this religious expert, an expert in the law, brings to the table. And Jesus turns the tables on him. The follow-up question to that, though, is why do you think, and this is building on this, why do you think Jesus uses a Samaritan to talk on what it means to love one's neighbor, Dr. Perkins? I think we're back to the idea. Is, uh, it shows the depths of the forgiveness of sin, and it shows that, that power it releases within you to love others. I, I don't think that we can separate our plight. I don't think we can even separate the plight of... Uh, of, uh, that our uh, judge was talking about without looking at how we have been damaged by so many years of, uh, uh, of racism. And I, sometimes I feel, and I think that motivates me. What motivates me, uh, well, let me tell you what motivates me. Uh, that, that when I tried to become a friend and develop a friendship with two white pastors in Mississippi in, 19, in the early 60s, and that he wanted to join with me in doing this reconciliation and work in Mississippi. Basically, he wasn't thinking about reconciliation. We were just primarily talking about evangelism and working together. And he went to his church and began, both of these pastors, but this one in particular in Mendenhall where I live, he began to share with his, pastor, share with his congregation how we needed to deal with this issue. What I told him what we had to do to make a difference in Mississippi, that we had to stay in this little town of Mendenhall long enough that we could win some of those young people to Jesus Christ, the people with the problem, somehow or another I had to disciple them so they could take responsibility for the problem there. And I said, we gotta stay in this community long enough that we can win some of these young people to Jesus Christ. We gotta disciple them in their faith We've got to help them to go off to school, get some skills, and bring these skills back to the community. Well, this young, this pastor wanted to help me, and he started talking to his congregation about it. The congregation so rejected him to this young man committed suicide. I was dealing with a Presbyterian pastor, and we were about at the same place in our development. And he was so rejected by his congregation that he also committed suicide. That's when I had been able to see what racism had done to white people. It had taken this gospel that's supposed to reconcile us to God and to each other, and that we had put that in our culture in a way that the gospel had lost its power. And what we had was a form of godliness that denied the power of God. I began to see that the oppressor also had been damaged. And so this must, and the, our healing had to be together. And part of what I'm doing now is not only do I want to see us blacks overcome our blame, but I want to see whites overcome their guilt and move out. And while people might be conscious of what they have done, they haven't dealt with it adequate and they haven't dealt with it as sin because I meet people all the time 
who will say to me that my grandmother was a wonderful old lady, but she hated niggas. I said, your old wonderful lady was a bigot. <laughs> your old wonderful lady is a bigot. And so this, the reason we are having this workshop like this is that we want people to see both sides of this. Uh, we are trapped together. We are, we are in a society, a culture that has captured us. We almost as black think that black theology is adequate and white theology has absolutely failed. What we need is a theology from God, a theology that calls for reconciliation in our society. And we not only need to talk about that because there are many good churches who talk about that, but they don't demonstrate that in their congregation. It's still a homogeneous, seeker-friendly congregation out there. We are, they are not really being reconciled. And we got to not only, as I say, talk about it, we got to demonstrate it. The gospel is a demonstration of God's love. And so we are to do it, as John says, not just in words and in tongue, but it must come out in deeds and in truth. We'll come back to that point a little later, the idea of it has to be in word and in deed, yes. in actions as well as truth, in truth and action. Uh, but this idea of the Good Samaritan, or more appropriately, the, ex the Samaritan of extraordinary mercy, uh, I think Jesus is really trying to break through to the heart of the religious expert who seeks to validate himself, who seeks to justify himself in the face of Jesus' own turning the tables on him and probing. And Jesus is reaching out to him, and I think he uses the Samaritan because that's the guy that this man would least expect. A scribe, a priest, a Levite, they walk on the other side of the road when they see their own countryman beaten, lying there near the point of death. They're left, they're leaving him to the side. It's the Samaritan who sees him, comes over in compassion, and actually takes of his own oil, his own wine, and cleanses the man's wounds. And I think Jesus is saying, you have to become like this Samaritan. And in a sense, as I read between the lines of the text, the Samaritans were oppressed, just like white people in our culture, and I'm part of that culture, have been guilty of oppression of other peoples. Uh, and so I need to see how I need to be broken, how I need to be transformed as someone from the dominant culture. And this man from the dominant culture, as I see him here, he needs to realize that he's in great need of God's mercy and God's love, just like the man who's lying there beaten near death. And I think there's something here for all of us today. Yeah, but, I, I, I think that that's, that's at the heart of the issue. At the heart of this issue of reconciliation, uh, uh, we've come face to face with that in CCDA. One of our members came together and had this idea that we should have some kind of a form where we as blacks who are feeling the the, the, the pressure of, of the sin of the past upon us and that we should take the initiative and that we should come up and say that we have got the strength now and that we want to forgive you white folks for the, for the long slavery and those many years of segregation and discrimination and when we tried to live out this vision in the 60s you begin to, this one nation under God, the rights to vote, one person, one vote, and all of that, bring our personhood. You know what they were doing for us? They was killing us in Mississippi. But we want to say now we are strong enough, we feel forgiven enough, that we want to now forgive you for what you have done to us. And our board of directors, I mean, many of us, many of them rejected that. We need to reach the place in our development that we can forgive. The power is on our ability to forgive. When Paul used the word, the forgiveness of sin, he's using that most powerful word that he had been forgiven. And so, yes, we must, and I, I really believe that we can do that strong enough. Well, at least it would be a witness to the bigger society. At least it would be a witness that we have overcome our own blame and that be a witness and pray that whites then could overcome that guilt and then together we could do like this good Samaritan. We could reach out to the broken people in our society and that's what it's going to take. I think we're talking about we have this book out Lincoln 
arms linking lives together. We've got it here. And of course, we are talking, <laughs> no, we are talking a lot about that in here. And we, we are talking about black and white church relationship. It's the successful churches in the urban community, really black ones, really don't have much time for white folk because they doubt whether or not their gospel can change them. I think we got to be confident in the gospel sufficient enough that this gospel become the power of God to bring whites and blacks together in one body. And we got to help people believe that and begin to live it out. Otherwise, this linking hearts and linking arms and linking lives is not going to work. It's going to take both of us together overcoming the damage. And what we're trying to say here, what I'm trying to say, is that why that damage is working itself out in terms of the problems and the poverty in our community. It's working itself out also in white folks designed to dominate the world uh, in our society. And I think that's why we are getting so much resistance uh, in other parts of the country because they see us still as imperialistic within our gospel. We are talking about it evangelical, but if you look at the real evangelicals out there, they are almost, I'm listening at it in the, in, in the political deal, and, and I'm, I'm almost able to see from a black perspective that evangelical is right now in this election is almost equaling racism in our society and how they had to go to the extreme to get a lady who was unqualified to satisfy that evangelical flavor down there. And those people are not very much concerned about the racial, uh, racial situation in our country. Man, we have got to forgive each other. That's what this story to me is all about. As I see it in terms of what the Good Samaritan or this Samaritan of Extraordinary Mercy has to say to us today is that in the situation before us, when Dr. Perkins and I have spoken in the city of Portland and elsewhere, I've had people come up to me and say, Dr. Perkins is a divisive voice, a divisive voice. And I've had to talk to people and say, well, if you're going to see Dr. Perkins as a divisive voice, then maybe you need to see Jesus as a divisive voice, because I haven't seen Dr. Perkins turn over any tables recently. But in American evangelicalism, we've got a danger on our hands, and that is that we've replaced the prophetic message with the message of prophet. As you had said several years ago in a book, that we've replaced the gospel of reconciliation with the gospel of church growth. And I think that's the danger when we talk in terms of success, and while we do want to grow our churches, but qualitative growth is always much more significant than quantitative growth. And so I think when you come in to speak on a message of reconciliation, it will often be seen as divisive, even though it's meant from the standpoint of love. And yet I was talking to a leader within a major parachurch organization, and that was within the dominant culture, by and large, where you were seen as a divisive voice. And so what are we talking about when we talk about true relationships? True relationships. Divisive? Well, then Jesus was. On the other hand, leader from a parachurch organization said he went in to talk to his own organization about issues of race. And he said, well, my experience and my exposure to these, to these issues comes through Dr. Perkins. And as soon as he said that, there was an eruption. And a leading African-American figure in that same organization said, Perkins is the reason why we as a people have not gone far enough. So he actually said just the opposite. Instead of divisive, it's actually he's keeping our people back. In the white community, I think we tend to look at things by way of relationships. We have this big buzzword of relationships, but if you know of Dr. Perkins' story of the seventh inning stretch, a white team and a black team have been playing baseball for, tw for seven innings. The score is 20 to nothing, and the white team's been found out to have been cheating for seven innings. The score is 20 to nothing, and they'll say, well, can we just shake hands? We're sorry. Let's have some hugs. Let's have a hugathon, and then let's, let's go back and go back to playing our game. What's the problem with that? The score is till, still 20 to zero. We talk about relationships, but we don't talk about the structures. As the book Divided by Faith talks about, evangelicals are individual and personal in orientation, but anti-structural. And yet relationships are structural and are meant to be structural means of engagement of overcoming the problems. 
And so those are the tensions. And we're not about warm and fuzzy relationships. We're not about justice for justice sake. We're about justice for reconciliation sake, about just relationships, true reconciliation in the love of God, truth, justice, and love. So I think that's a key part of what this conference is about, the CCDA conference, and what the church at large needs to be about. And that's what we're about in the drum majors partnership as well. You got another question? Well, I was going to say just how this speaks to me as a theologian, Okay. if that's all right. I was just thinking about this yesterday as Dr. Perkins was speaking in another context. And as I look back at my own life as a trained academic, or as an academic theologian, is that I feel that at times I've been in danger of being guilty of being this religious expert who comes to Jesus to test him. Because as an academic, and I love academic theology and the like, but there can be dangers, knowledge puffs up. And we can so often miss the forest while looking at the trees. And this man comes to test Jesus, and when Jesus turns the tables on him, he seeks to validate himself, justify himself. Well, who is my neighbor then? And Jesus, again, takes it deeper into his heart. But for me, as I see this issue, you know, Jesus doesn't respond by saying, you know, think this and you will live. He says, do this and you will live. And I have to make sure that I'm not about a theology of disengagement, but about a theology of engagement. And that's why, to me, it's so important that I'm here to learn from the CCDA because I feel that theology in American Christianity needs to be revisioned in seminaries and colleges across the land. So often what Dr. Perkins and what you stand for is often seen as urban ministry, and that's powerful, that's potent, that's, that's necessary. But it needs to be seen as that this is normal Christianity, and this is part of what Bible and theology departments are about. And so I need to come... Because that's, that's really where the power is. I hate to say, but that's still where a lot of the white dominant culture is in terms of we've got the Bible and the theology, and that's the religious expert in the law. But I feel like I'm also the man half beaten to death or near death on the road. And this isn't meant as hype, but this is hope. Several years ago, we had Dr. Perkins speak in Portland. And he spoke not only at Multnomah where I teach, and I'm very grateful for my school because they make it possible for Dr. Perkins to come and speak in Portland and at school in another context many times. But Dr. Perkins, when he came to speak in Portland, I shared a bit of this last year, but one of my former students is Tony the Beat Poet from Blue Light Jazz, worked with me in my institute, New Wine, New Wineskins, and he said, you're bringing Dr. Perkins to Multnomah? I'll make sure to get him into Reed. And Reed is not a bastion of evangelical orthodoxy. It produces, besides being considered in the Princeton Review, one of the most non-religious schools in the country, it produces more Rhodes Scholars than any school in the nation other than the Ivy League schools. And when he shared his story that was shared about last night, the Reed students gave him a two to three minute standing ovation for a life so will live because as the beat poet said afterwards, he's taking his convictions all the way to their logical, or shall I say, his Christian convictions all the way to their illogical conclusion. It makes no sense to Rhodes Scholars, but this is the power of the gospel. This is the power of the gospel. But for me, even more potent perhaps is when we were driving to Henry Greenwich's church to talk at an ex-offender outreach. You were doing a talk at a benefit dinner that night. And I said, and this is a few years ago, Elizabeth was with us and Reed was in around 2000, 2001. This was like 2006, 2007. I said, Dr. Perkins, I know about your story back in 1970 in Mississippi, but how are you viewed in Mississippi today? And he said, just matter-of-factly, because I asked him as we were driving down King Boulevard, and by the way, as a friend told me yesterday, just think where Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard is placed in most cities or all cities in our country. What communities does it go through? It's usually in a very impoverished community, and I'll leave it to you to think about what the implications or the connotations might be. But I asked him, so how are you viewed in the state of Mississippi today? And he said, matter-of-factly, well, in many contexts, I'm viewed kind of like a hero because of my work on reconciliation. Every time the state newspapers want to do an article on reconciliation, they want to quote me, and he started laughing. And he said, it's as if I, quote, I created the term reconciliation. He says, that's a biblical category. It's not my category. And then he said, but you know, as we're driving down King Boulevard on the way to a CCDA type event for ex-offenders, he said, but when I think about my fame, my fame hasn't built too many houses for the poor. In fact, it's built no houses for the poor, so I don't put any stock in my fame. 
I almost lost control of the wheel. I mean, there was no media in there. And again, for theology, where it can so often be about power and knowledge puffing up, this just destabilized me. And this, to me, the Reed College event, I'm a Multnomah Seminary professor. I'm thinking, I was the one going forward for the altar call at Reed College. And I'm the Christian evangelical, and I'm thinking, this messes with my heart. It takes it from the head to the heart. And when it was at the situation driving down King Boulevard, I thought, man, this is like healing my wounds as I lie on the side of the road. And Dr. Perkins was used of God. And this is about Jesus, not about Dr. Perkins. It's just that we need to become those Samaritans, all of us, of extraordinary mercy as we're united to Christ in the power of the Spirit as his love flows down. And for me, as I see it, it's this idea that Dr. Perkins has been used of God to heal my own wounds, heal my own wounds with wine and with oil. And so that's what this partnership is about for me, because I need this as I seek to be re-envisioned to do the tra task of theology for the church. Uh, let, let, let me read a passage here. You put, you're throwing all of those uh, goodies up on me. <laughs> uh, let me read a passage here. You know, I, I, I think you, we got to believe right and believe right. The biblical idea of really deep belief is acting upon that belief. That's what makes Abraham the father of our faith. Not only did God speak to him and make a promise to him, a long, a long range promise to him, and Abraham acted upon that and lived it out. And so the whole idea that faith without works is, is, is dead is the same way while we might talk about reconciliation, that we really have got to do reconciliation. It's something that we do together. And as we come close to this, let me read this passage here. This is Paul's um, uh, summary of the text. This is the biblical text for reconciliation in the Bible. Listen to what it says. It says, um, he says here, Paul says here, henceforth, this is uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, and I'm looking at verse 16 where he says, wherefore henceforth know we no person after the flesh. Although we have known Christ after the flesh, we know him no more. Therefore, if any person be in Christ, He's a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things become new. And all things of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given unto us the message of the word of reconciliation. The very intention of the gospel was to reconcile alienated humanity to a holy God, and to live that out, it had to be that the world would know that because of how we related to each other across racial and social barriers. And when we talk about a church as a black church or as a white church, as a church, we have limited the gospel, and we are preaching the gospel with limited expectation. See, we're not preaching the gospel really believing that the gospel, and that's the biblical thought, the, the Holy Spirit takes the story of the love of God demonstrated in Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. The Holy Spirit takes that truth and applies to our heart, and that reconciles us. We see within that our own sin and that we confess our sins and we're reconciled to God. And then we're to live that out in terms of our reconciliation to each other. And once you become a believer, born again, the racial situation is not important as it relates to our relationship in society. He said that we know no one after the flesh, although we had known Jesus as a Jew, we don't know him as a Jew no more because we are a new creature in Jesus Christ. And then he goes on in verse uh, 19 and said, did you know that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us, and has given unto us the word of reconciliation? That is in fact the gospel. We have made reconciliation a little sub part of the gospel 
this was the way God had to bring us back to himself. Listen to what he says here. We then, we then are ambassadors, all of us, each one in this room. This one person don't have a ministry of reconciliation. That's also limiting it. That's the whole work of the whole church, taking this whole gospel on a whole mission to the whole world. That's all of our task. Don't organize no reconciliation committee. What we need to do is to bring the gospel back in the center. And the power of the gospel is right now in the world. Do you realize that almost all the walls that are being raised right now are racial, ethnic, or tribal? And the work of the church is to be peacemakers peacemakers in the world, and that we don't really understand our mission. We have really in America, in colonizing the people, we have damaged ourselves in colonizing the gospel and limiting that gospel and preaching it in a racial way. And we really do have a gospel that divides us. And because we are not believing this word. Let me conclude this here, now what he says. He says, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray that you would stand in God's place. See, the idea that we uh, are standing in Christ's place, and in our message, look what he says here then, for he has made him who knew no sin to be made sin for us, that we might be made the righteous of God in him. And then he concludes this text by saying, saying, we then, the church, all of us, as workers together with him, he said, I beseech you that you receive not the grace of God in vain. That if we have experienced this reconciliation power by God's grace, by God's grace, if he have entered into our life and by his own grace saved us, he have saved us in order for us to be reconciled. And if we don't become reconciled, we have received God's grace in vain. And that worries me. That worries me as we preach the gospel and have isolated reconciliation as a small part of the gospel when it is in fact the very center of the gospel and what Jesus is doing. And then you know that's in Jesus' mission when he was here on earth. Whenever he wanted to talk about real love and compassion, to show what real love could do, he used a Samaritan. He used a Samaritan because people could see God's redemptive grace against those people who he hated so very, very much. We about, uh, by time is about gone. Amen. You want to close out? Take it away. Well, you know, Paul got this book. We got this book here <laughs> on a... Uh, you got to have a book. You got to have a book. You know what, what thrilled me last night? What thrilled me last night? When we started this ministry uh, 20 years ago, there was Run Sider's book, Rich Christian in the Age of Hunger. There was my book, Let Justice Roll Down. Pretty soon, Spencer and Chris came in with More Than Equals. K. Ryan and people came with Breaking Down Walls. And last night, I went out there and I looked at the, all of those books, how God has blessed us and how God is using even people like Lisa and others to share this message. Uh, and when, I'm just so thankful for all of y'all that join with us. I know I'm gonna be teaching tomorrow morning, but all of y'all gonna be going home. Uh, so I want to say this, I want to say this. Uh, and, and Paul has wrote this book Consuming Jesus. You need to get this book. You need to read this book. This is not, and this, this is what is motivating me. This very book is what is motivating me to join with Paul as we go out together. I think when people see us and hear us together, I think it can have a great amount of impact uh, uh, in society. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you, Lord, that we could spend this time here together. And I pray that this story 
uh, of the Good Samaritan might really be a force to transform our lives. Now we pray for the remaining of the meeting this morning. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's thank Paul. God bless you. Good morning. Now, if you're really itching to get your holy kiss in this morning, do it quickly. Uh, because before we transi transition into our main session this morning, we're going to watch some DVDs. So get your holy kiss in, don't go anywhere, and watch up screen. <laughs> 